Hey, uh, YouTubers, Tazman here, bringing you another episode of Taz Teaches Fantasy Grounds or Fantasy Grounds 101 or Fantasy Grounds from the Ground Up. I don't know what I'm going to call it yet. <laughs> so, in the last episode, we uh, joined our uh, we joined our, our table uh, and we selected Mohawk the Gremlin, which I. I wanted to give you just a little info on that. So that was for a Christmas one shot that I did with some people. I was just on one of the Fantasy Grounds Discord servers and uh, someone was saying, hey, I'm going to do a one shot. Anyone interested in joining? So I said, sure. <laughs> so I got in. It was really fun. Uh, so uh, what we're going to talk about in this episode is basically these buttons, all these buttons over here. and we're going to just talk a little bit about this dice tower, which will involve the dice again, which kind of makes sense, right? Um, so anyway, uh, as you can see, and then maybe in the next ep episode, we'll talk more about Mohawk and such. So uh, let's go ahead and just start off with the dice tower. Now, depending on your GM setup, he might or might not have the dice tower. The dice tower is a really good thing. Um, and you can move it where you want. You can like, un you, just like we could with this guy, we can click on it and now we can move it. I like to put it kind of over here and a lot, I've seen a lot of other people do this also, but, uh, I lock it right here and then I kind of arrange this guy to fit basically right where it is. So if we do something like that like that kind of make a nice little hut over our dice keep them nice and safe and then we'll go ahead and lock that back up um, so uh, let's just talk about this button so it's enabled by going to settings and if your GM has it allowed you will have dice tower right here and you will be able to actually turn it on or off um, however this is basically off of the table it's the things you can set in your settings and we kind of jumped ahead as to the buttons is actually just this part you can chat ring uh, ring on whisper uh, die manual entry so that's where you actually have to enter your dice values um, target remove on miss so if you miss a target it removes it automatically we'll talk about it later um, and auto centering the map which is on so you can just click these in the center and it turns them on or off you can also click on the side, the little arrow, and you'll see other options such as multi on or off. Um, and then these other options, you can just see what the DM has things set to. So um, you can see show GM rows, show GM rolls is on, which means generally you'll be able to see what the GM's rolling, and this dice tower if this is on the dice tower is available um, if this is off the dice tower is not available so let's just talk about the dice tower since we've been just talking about it a lot so the dice tower in the game there's something called metagaming metagaming is where you take your knowledge as a human being and inject it into your character as you can see here my gremlin his intelligence is only a plus one. He's a little bit over average. He's not the smartest tool in the shed. So maybe things I know, I, I, my gremlin won't know. And some of those things are when I'm doing checks. Sometimes the DM or the GM will want the player not to know what their role was. So if I roll in the chat window out here, obviously I can see I just rolled a 10. But let's say I'm rolling a perception check. So I'm looking around and I'm trying to see if I see anything out of the ordinary. Well, if I roll out here and I roll low or high, if I roll high, I know I see something really cool. I should see everything. If I roll low, bad example, if I roll low, that's a pretty good example, then I know, hmm, Maybe I should do another perception check. Enter in the dice tower. This helps avoid that kind of stuff. Now, if the GM says, hey, uh, Mohawk, roll me a perception check. 
I drop it in the dice tower, and now I just get a shadow, and I can see that I rolled a d20, but I don't see what I actually rolled. So the GM on his side is going to look here and say, ooh, he rolled a 2. That's pretty bad. And then they can describe what I see based off of that. Now, if, if I knew I rolled a 2 and he says, well, you see a tree, and that's about it, I would say, okay, I'm going to look again because uh, I know I rolled bad. But in this case, the GM can simply say, you see a tree. And I don't know. As far as I know, I rolled a 20, and that's all that's available to me. So this is really good. It also is really good for things like stealth. If I roll a 2 on a stealth, that means I'm not very stealthy at all. If I roll a 20, I know I just turned invisible. If I, if I roll it in here and the GM says, you feel like you're stealthed. I don't know if that means I am or if I'm not. So this is very handy and that's why I really like the Dice Tower and what it does because it really kind of helps the player take the what the actual character feels and sees and apply it to them instead of vice versa where they're saying, no, I rolled bad, I need to look harder or I need to look more. So that's what the Dice Tower is for and I think it's epic. Um, so it, it just hides the rolls. Now, on the other hand, we have show GM rolls. So if the GM here rolls the die, you'll see that and you'll see that I rolled a 20 and they see I rolled a 20. It works the same way here. If I'm GM and I want to roll a secret roll, uh, like a bad guy, like they're walking around and I want to see if a bad guy notices them, I would say, ooh, a 16. They will see that I rolled something. Actually, they'll just see, that if they're paying attention, they'll see the ghost die. But they will not know. So you'll see here, if we do this again, you'll see the ghost die, but you won't actually see a value. And this way I can say, okay, the bad guy, he only had to get a 15 in order to see them. Uh, therefore, he actually sees them. Where this bad guy doesn't see anything. He's oblivious. So there's the dice tower in a nutshell. Really, really cool tool if you ask me. So let's go ahead and jump into all these buttons over here and talk about them. So one of the, two of the most important are these first two. The sword and this little people, two little people. The sword is called the combat tracker. And if we click on that, you can see here that we have Reximus. This is actually my brother's character. And you can see that uh, there's Goblin 3 and an adult blue dragon. Well, if we go in here real quick, uh, let's go look, combat tracker. You'll see there's actually a lot more than just a goblin number three. There's a four, a two, a one, there's a pit trap, uh, there's a snare trap. So there's all these other things, but you'll see that these ones are hidden. If I do this, there it is, you can now see it. Now another nice thing about this is I can see the order. This is the initiative, the order that people go in. I can see my HP, but I can only see a basic status of the enemy. I can see healthy, I can see wounded, I can see heavily wounded, and I think I can see dying. So those are the options that I see here, whereas the GM, for example, let's, let's just take, well he has 200 health, that'll take a while. Uh, let's take Goblin 3 and give him a little hit. Let's make him down one. So now you can see he's wounded right and this is available this is the same as the the GM describing to you that he he looks a little wounded right if we say maybe two let's see what that does still wounded this is only seven hit points so I don't know where it's gonna actually change three still wounded four now it's heavily wounded uh, let's do six still heavily wounded. There wasn't really a break point where it said uh, anything else. And then of course if we hit seven, he is now in a dying state, which means he's basically dead. Um, so the combat tracker is going to be where you keep track of 
the order that everyone's fighting, who's in the who's in play and who you can see. So if we pull up, well, we're not there yet. We're not going to do that. But we can see here the combat. And we can see, like, if we get wounded uh, or our teammates get wounded, let's see, 12, let's just do a 6. And you'll see that now you can see I've got 6. Uh, I'm, I'm hurting, right? And we'll explain a little bit more about that in just a little bit. So um, this is the combat tracker. Really great for keeping track of the order of battle and whose turn it is and what the status of the people are. The next one is called the party tracker or the party sheet. And here uh, in, in the players mode, you see less. So for example, here we can see the money values or we can see items. So nice thing about fantasy grounds is when you win battles and stuff like that, instead of, you know, everyone saying, okay, well, I'm going to take this. I'm going to take this. I'm going to take this. Uh, you get this much gold. You get this silver. Yeah. I'm going to take this gem and, and slowing down the battle. You just put everything in this party sheet. And it'll have a big list. It'll have all the platinum pieces, gold pieces, electrum pieces, silver pieces, and copper pieces you have. Um, and when all is said and done and the, you're at the end of the campaign and you want to divvy stuff out, you can actually use a party sheet for that. There's also this order uh, part. And this is handy for watch order to tell... Um, you know, for the first watch, who's the first watch? Uh, you know, he's going to be first watch. Uh, so he's going to be second watch, third watch, so on and so forth. So you can keep track of that. Also, you can keep track of the order of the party. So, you know, Reximus is here. We could have Gremlin. Uh, we could, well, actually, I have to drag Gremlin onto the party sheet. Uh, so go party sheet and go Gremlin. Oh, move, uh, we can close that. We move Mohawk in, and now uh, actually we need one more thing. Go to the order tab, and we just need to put Gremlin on the sheet. Now, right now he doesn't have a picture, but we'll take care of that. Don't worry. Um, so if we go back, move that one. Now you can see Gremlin. So we could say, yeah, he's first. That way, if if the DM or GM is saying, okay, there's bad guys up here. Who are they going to see first? We can get an idea of what the order of the party is and who is most likely to get attacked first. Uh, who's most likely not going to be able to be seen or attacked. Like if we had people here and here, odds of little Mohawk getting hit would probably be really slim. And then here you can see, I believe, uh, do you do... Any, I think it's the GM that says the order. I've never really used this much. So if we say he's order number, yeah. So I could say he's going to be the first, and there you go. It starts with zero, so you could say zero is the first watch. So first watch and second watch, if it's a four-hour thing. That way I know that Reximus is going to be watching for four hours. Then he's going to sleep while Mohawk watches. Um so kind of handy things um, that will bring us. Let me really quick while we're talking about watches and stuff, it kind of makes sense to do this. So this is an option that is not available in the um, players of the table. It's only the GM. This is kind of, it, it sets the theme of your game, but it also kind of gives a visual clue to your, your players as to what time of day it is. So here you can see this is basically noonday, and here we are in noonday. Everything's kind of bright. If we go to evening or dusk, you'll see it turns kind of a grayish color, purplish color. And you'll see that the players also does. In fact, let's move this down here. Uh, then if, like, the GM says, okay, now it's nighttime, uh, you know, the campfire is lit or whatever, you kind of get this color. And then finally, this is early morning or something, you know, and you get kind of this greenish color. So it, it kind of helps the players understand what time of day it is. Um, personally, I use it more as a theme and I like the purple, the darker purple theme. I think it looks nice. 
So that is the party sheet. The next is the calendar. We really do not have the calendar enabled. This is like you could keep track of when you're going to play next and stuff like that. Uh, it also sets up where you can actually set up, a, you know, so you could go in there and see when holidays in your world are on special days. Uh, you know, you can actually set up some pretty cool stuff, but I really have never used that much. The next is this little color palette. And what this does is allow you to change the color of your dice. So if you wanted to add more red to your dice, let's arrange those guys. If you want to add more red to your dice, you would click red. And this is a lot of red. This is a little red. This is just a tiny bit of red. If we want to make them lighter, we could do that. If we want to make them darker, we can do that. If we want to maybe try and make them purple, there we go. We add red and blue, we get purple, right? A nice purple color make them a light purple or a dark purple your choice dealer's choice um the other thing is let's say you want to make them really light dice like a pink like that well this makes it really hard to read so you can actually toggle the text to be black or white so that's basically that button wow this is this might go a little over 30 minutes uh the next button we have here is modifiers Modifiers is basically a souped up version of this guy down here where you could say, oh, the person's under cover. So you could, you know, click cover and roll the die. And it, well, we're not in a battle or anything, uh, but it would automatically know that this is going to do reduced damage or soup cover, maybe super cover or heavy cover. Uh, attack of opportunity. We have critical damage. If you do critical damage, you click that. Let's see if it'll do anything. Oh, actually, critical damage would probably be with this. Although I don't think it's going to do anything since we don't, we're not doing this in the combat trigger. And those dice are ugly. So let's let's get back to that purple. Maybe a little. Ooh, there we go. A nice pepo there. Um, so anyway, that's your modifiers. Uh, Usually you don't have to do too much with this. The next one over, this little guy with stars above his head is effects. Um, I don't know that players can actually do a whole lot with this. Uh, if we go to the, say, combat sheet, can I add me? No, I think uh, we have to do it in here. Let's go ahead, combat. Let's go ahead and add Mohawk. There we go. So now Mohawk's in there. So let's say I'm invisible. Let's see if this will work. Yeah, so now I'm invisible. This means if someone is trying to attack me, like if Rexmas is trying to attack me here, I don't know why he would, but for some reason he's attacking me. Um, Rexmas, which I won't be able to pull up his sheet, he would, I don't know, let's see, can I, let's, I don't want to get this too complicated. Uh, let's see, Reximus, he's going to hit me. Where am I? Where is the gremlin? I need to get gremlin on here. Oh, actually, it's from the combat sheet. Where? By the way, normally you have more space to do all this. I am actually have this all in like a little, little uh, 1280 by 720 window. So there's going to be lots of moving of windows here but let's say Reximus here wants to attack um, Mohawk but Mohawk is invisible so that means he's probably gonna have a hard time hitting him unless he gets lucky so if we say take his eh, let's do longsword drop it on top of him who's invisible and you'll see it actually rolled two dice at disadvantage automatically because he's invisible very hard and he misses like I said, we will talk about all this stuff later and we'll get into great detail. And you're always welcome to ask questions to get even more detail. Oh, one other thing you'll notice that whatever your color of dice are is what color this little dot is. Um, before it was black, now it's purple. So it, I don't know how much that really helps because I can barely see it as is. So. Anyway, that's effects. And then to get rid of his effect, let's say he's done being invisible, you can just turn it off by clicking that and clicking it again. 
Um, if he's paralyzed where he can't move, same thing. If you want to know what things are, um, usually, not here, but usually you can look up references and stuff like that. I don't know that we'll have a chance to get into that until we get into heavy duty stuff. Uh, we also already looked at the, the options, so we're not going to do that. So the next thing is these big and buttons. Now, like I said before, if you don't see all these buttons, don't worry. Uh, if you click the library button, which should always be visible, you can actually set what buttons are visible. So right now, it's all. If I'm creating a PC, you don't need story, you don't need quests and stuff like that. You're just creating a PC. So if you click that, now you'll see I have PC creation specific buttons. If I'm playing the game, I don't need GM things because I won't necessarily have this. Uh, well, it might have story. I don't know. Play. Yeah, it has story. I don't know what it doesn't have. Maybe it doesn't have. It has items. I don't know. We could. It doesn't have parcels. I know that because parcels are GM only. Probably won't have encounters. Yeah. So anyway, right now for this, we're just having it be the all. Now, since we're in the library button, let's just talk a little bit about what it is. So the library button is where, one, you can select and you can customize and say, oh, I don't want these, I want these. You know, you can actually say what buttons you want of the big buttons, not the small ones. But you can choose the ones you want um, if, if you want. Like, for example, if you have it in Create PC, but you still want to have feats <laughs> then you or encounters whoops feats is over there uh, you can turn on encounters I don't know why you would but you could <laughs> so there you go or tables maybe all right so uh, anyway that's that's all we're gonna do about the buttons um, so the other thing you can do when you're in uh, the library is you can actually load modules now if you click the modules down here at the bottom you'll see actually we probably won't see little webs on any of these because this is the same computer but if you're if you're being hosted by someone and you're joining a table you actually see what looks like little spider webs in the corner and that means they're sharing these things um, it's always a good idea only to load things you know you need so like if I'm creating a character obviously I want the characters uh, the players handbook if I know I'm creating a character that has a subclass in say uh, Xanther's guide to everything then I would click that one too the thing about these is these are registered books if if your DM has bought them he's sharing a virtual copy with you but it's not actually putting it on your system so once you're no longer with his table all the books that he had will no longer be available to you and because of this and because it's only creating a virtual copy kind of thing on your system and it's not even really a virtual copy it's links back to his system you can get quite a bit of lag if you're trying to load too many books or too many resources so a lot of times the the DM or GM will tell you what books you should be loading Sorry, throat's getting a little uh, dry. So, for example, if my my GM said that, okay, well, you can choose a character from Player's Handbook uh, and Xanther's Guide to Everything, right? Then I can do that. He might also say, and I want you to go find where it says coding, and we can actually just search and COD like that and now everything with coding sometimes when you're actually looking up books and stuff this is the best way to do it because it's actually going to sort if there's way too many items um, like for example here if there's way too many items then it's really gonna bog down your system and trying to scroll down this list will actually freeze up your system for up to like five so minutes so it's best to like if they say oh yeah you have I'll I'll give you access to Xanther's guide or I want you to load uh, Rob Tui's 
uh, spell coding, spell effects. Uh, so if we come here, we can see effects coding classes. Maybe he wants you to have this. Uh, we have classes, feats, races, spells, uh, maybe adventuring gear. No, actually not adventuring gear. So each one of these you click is going to bog down your system. And it might be a good idea to click one, wait for the book to look like it opens, and then move on. Uh, but it can actually take a hit. So now that I've loaded at least two things in here, and if we get rid of the code now, you can actually see everything. I don't have very much shared here, but um, we can actually another one that's kind of handy would be the Elemental Evils Guide. Gives you some other classes and such. So anyway, um, <clears throat> once you have the ones loaded, it will make things more available to you here. So if we go into spells, because these are spell, all these are considered spell effects. Now if we go to the sort, you'll actually see we have uh, effects coding for class features, feats, race traits, spells, and so on and so forth. Rob 2E has gone through and actually gone through every one of the spells and made them better and all the different uh, other things, you know, racial traits and such, and made them better so that they actually work coding wise. So it's really a nice thing. Uh, and you can buy his, his uh, mods and stuff like that relatively cheap, I think. I think like all his coding ones, the, those four that I loaded, I think it's like 20 bucks for all four of them. Um, really, and what they do is just awesome. So uh, so that's kind of the library. Now the other thing you can do in, in the library is like we can actually click on the player's handbook and then you can see here that it says images, tables, backgrounds, and there's one called reference manual. The reference manual is basically the entire book. So if I wanted to go look up things about races and it has pictures and everything else in there and then we can go to the next page choosing a race we can choose say a dwarf and look at it but it's all been encoded to also be with fantasy grounds. So if I want to know race dwarf I can click on this gives me uh, more information on it. Probably a lot of the information that you have up here. Uh, if we want to, for example, here's the elf. You can get all that information on them. And then you also have the uh, subclasses, wood elf, dark elf, and high elf. So you can get all kinds of information. Remember how just a little while ago we were like, oh, I'm not sure what does um, paralyze do, right? So we could type P-A-R-A, -A, paralyze. And maybe we can find it down in here. So, uh, fighter pallet and uh, 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 equipment, armor shields. It would probably be under conditions. So, if we come in here and look, there's paralyzed. So, when a character is paralyzed, uh, it is inca incapacitated. See the condition and cannot move or speak, the creatures automatically fail strength and dexterity saving throws. Attack rolls against the creature have advantage. Uh, any attack that hits the creature is a critical hit if the attacker is within five feet of the creature. So if someone's paralyzed and you're next to it and you hit it, it's basically an automatic 20. And we'll talk more about that later. So anyway, you can kind of look and see it has the full book. If you want to know more, uh, you can actually also click them here. So if we want to look at races, for example, go down here to races, click the little eye, and we'll see uh, the same stuff that we saw before, but it's in a, a, a special format for Fantasy Grounds. And you'll notice it actually has, you know, it still has the pictures, so you can click on those, get the pictures for an elf. But it has these additional things down here. Remember it had sub races, but it just listed them here. We can see it sub races. We can choose high elf and see that, so on and so forth. So it's kind of handy to have these books. But once you're in the game, once you've created your character, only load what you need. In other words, you might regret it uh, just because it'll bog down your system. So once you've got your character created, um, 
the DM might say there are special ones that you might need, maybe a critical hit table or something like that. And then, of course, you will need that. But if you don't need the critical hit table or anything, then uh, you can pretty much clear this thing out because when you create your character, it'll actually add everything to it. Wow, we didn't even get anywhere except for library. And we're at 30 minutes, so I think I'm going to go ahead and end this here. Um, so in part two, just recap really quick, we went over all our buttons here. We went over the combat tracker, the party tracker, or the party sheet. Uh, effects was a big one. The palette for changing this. The dice tower, epic. And we didn't actually get into character so much, did we? Uh, and library. So in the next episode, hopefully we'll get all these other buttons done because they're a lot less complex. I think we sh probably should be able to. So thank you guys so much for watching. I do hope you enjoyed. If you did, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below. Aside from that, comment, like, and subscribe. Follow me on Twitter. Check out my Discord and my other channels. And don't forget about the great big game giveaway. When we hit 1,000 subs, we are giving away 57 Steam games. That's pretty cool if you ask me. Um, and that's on my Tasman channel. Like I said, this these videos might be on both my Tasman and Taz Teaches just so they're available in more places. Um, but uh, be sure to sub. And uh, that's it. Until next time, I'll be seeing you later. Bye.